We are profiling some day one and day two wide receivers from two specific college football heavyweights from this past season for the Dolphins in the 2024 NFL Draft as Miami looks to continue to keep explosive playmakers littered throughout their offense into this upcoming season. You are Locked On Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami, welcome to another episode of Locked On Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked On Dolphins, co-host of Locked On NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Tip of the cap to our everydayers because it is your team every day here on the Locked On Network. We don't just say it, we live it here. Today's episode of Locked on Dolphins is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase on last minute tickets. Lowest prices guaranteed. Today on the show, we're looking at uh, five specific wide receivers, one of which is probably not going to be on the board for the Dolphins, but uh, two specific college football programs that have top of the draft wide receiver talent that is available. Yesterday on the show, we looked at what positions I would generally perceive to be not options for Miami early in the draft. And if you start a quarterback and work your way down the list, the first position that was there uh, that, that was that made the cut was wide receiver. So I've been starting my, my heavy scouting process, putting together my draft board for the Dolphins. And these two college football programs were the first place that I started because of the amount of volume of wide receivers that they had. And that's University of Washington and the University of Texas. When you include tight ends, each one of these programs has three pass catchers that could feasibly be top 100 picks in the 2024 NFL draft. So really impressive volume for both of those programs. Of course, they played each other in the college football playoff semifinal this year, played a really entertaining game that went down the last play of the game. Uh, so uh, lots of opportunities to get cross pollination with these players against each other as well. Last season, when we went hot and heavy on draft, I did a bunch of player specific dives. I'm going to try my best to bunch players together into shows with similar buckets and similar themes like this, with the hope being that we can cover more ground. So we're starting with wide receivers today. And the University of Washington, we, the first thing you have to do is you have to, have to establish the talent and where these players are projected to go in the NFL draft. Roma Dunze from Washington is the best player of any of the talents available at wide receiver from either the University of Washington or the University of Texas. He is generally perceived to be a top 10 pick, and I would not be surprised. He's got a really nice blend of just about everything. We'll talk about him briefly in segment two. Not too much time because that's a player where you'd have to have something catastrophic with his draft stock between now and the end of April for him to be an option for the Dolphins. And I don't think trade up is, is really a feasible um, pathway uh, for Miami to acquire specifically a wide receiver with the other means that this team has and the limited resources they already have from a draft capital standpoint. The next predictive wide receiver to be drafted, I'd say the next best player to be a day one option is Texas's A.D. Mitchell. Uh, Adonai Mitchell originally went to University of Georgia, transferred to Texas, had a monster season this year, and then came out and had a monster NFL combine where he ran a 4-3-4. Uh, and, and he's probably somebody, when you look at how the draft shakes out this year, you'll have the three wide receivers that, that go early in Adunze, Malik Neighbors from LSU, and Marvin Harrison Jr. from Ohio State. And then you have Brian Thomas, who's not a part of this conversation. We'll include him in another conversation that we'll get to a little later in the, the pre-draft process. But uh, Thomas is kind of the bridge between Tier 1 and Tier 2. You could see him falling closer to Tier 1 predictively in, in the teens, or you could see him falling into uh, potentially the 20s and being a part of, of the grouping of players that Miami would be in consideration. I would say... After Thomas, who's kind of the consensus wide receiver four, Mitchell has an argument to be wide receiver five. And there's a ton of teams, whether it's Detroit or Buffalo or Miami 
or Kansas City, um, potentially Baltimore. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting at least Arizona. If they pass on wide receiver early, if they trade out and then draft something else, uh, they have they have Cleveland's pick or Houston's pick. They have a pick uh, in the 20s already. Um, and a potential trade out candidate for a team like Minnesota to come up and get a quarterback at four. So there's a slew of teams that need wide receivers. And I expect a secondary run on the position to go in the twenties. It's a question of whether or not Miami is going to be a part of that. A.D. Mitchell expected to be a part of that conversation. I think the only other pass catcher that has a chance to be a first round player, and it's because of a record setting performance uh, at the NFL combine is Xavier Worthy. Uh, Worthy, the number two, if you will, at the uh, University of Texas. Very different player than Mitchell from a build perspective. I think his strengths are very different than A.D. Mitchell's. There's a fascinating contrast in how those two skill sets played off each other at Texas within that offense. Um, but more of a diminutive player, 5'11", 165 pounds, ran a 4'2", 1", just crazy fast 40-yard dash. And the explosiveness, it's it's... It's so evident when you watch him on film. We'll talk about him a little bit as well. Uh, we'll probably bunch him into the round one options because I certainly don't think he'd be there at 55 for Miami. Uh, after that, you have two more Washington wide receivers, uh, Jalen McMillan and then Jalen Polk. Uh, that Washington offense had athleticism out the wazoo in the skill group this year. They had a tight end, number 37, who popped to me as well. And then they had a Michigan State transfer uh, who's not in this year's draft class, number four, who they used quite a bit. Uh, so so that Washington offense is going to have some, some players in, in follow-up years for draft classes as well that are going to be names to know. But Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk are, are definitive day two options uh, out of that Washington offense as well. And then uh, kind of a hybrid. We've, we've mentioned this name already uh, this week on the program, Jatavian Sanders, a tight end from Texas, uh, detached from the set often, uh, not a lot of success as an inline player, a lot of correlation with how Miami has used tight ends, although I do think it's a redundant player relative to Jonu Smith and his addition to the depth chart with how Miami has valued tight end thus far in the Mike McDaniel regime. So, you technically have three pass catchers from both Washington and Texas, which gives us plenty of ground to cover. We're going to start with that uh, first tier. Briefly touch on Adunze just to do our due diligence. And then we'll get into A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. So make sure that you stick with us. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the tourney, whether you're betting big on an upset or you're betting on a one seed, it's time to go dancing with America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who is going to win it all. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Washington didn't cut down any proverbial nets, but they got close. They played in the national championship game against Michigan and Michigan's another team that has multiple pass catchers to know <laughs> between Cornelius Johnson and Roman Wilson. So uh, lots, lots of names to be familiar with. That's what this time of year, the next month here on this program is going to be all about. And I'm like a pig in slop, right? Because <laughs> I, I got my, my career in football started as a draft Nick. And then kind of skewed team specific after I started draft specific. But the Dolphins were the thing that pushed me into being a draft, Nick, because of the lull, that dreaded 15 year stretch from about 02 to 16 was a lot of miserable seasons starting in about late October, early November, when you start watching college football games, looking for that name that's going to pop this, be like, oh, that's God's going to save the Dolphins. And it, it never really happened. But uh, um, I owe a lot of my draft passion to the Dolphins. So, so we've come full circle here. So let, let's touch briefly on Roma Dunze uh, from University of Washington, who is 6'3", 212 pounds, ran a 4'4", 40-yard dash, very explosive player in all facets, 39-inch vertical jump, uh, ran 
well with the shuttles. Not a lot of wide receivers run the shuttles at the NFL Combine. He ran a 6.88 sub seven second three cone drill. Says seven seconds is kind of that magic number for wide receivers. If you're going to run it, you better run sub seven seconds. Um, and then a 4.03 second short shuttle, which is starting on the midline, five yards to one direction, back across the midline, 180 degree pivot uh, across the midline, another five yards the other way. So you start zero, five, 10 back the other way is 15, five back to the midline for 20 yard short shuttle, a 4.03 second, which is 91st percentile. So of all wide receivers to come through the NFL combine since the year 2001. And he spent a lot of time. I believe I remember a uh, stayed on the field at the combine running the short shuttle repeatedly, trying to break four seconds. And he had like already had like the best time, but he wanted to run. So four seconds. So really neat, like competitiveness for him with himself at the combine. Uh, probably going to be a top 10 selection. There's teams, whether it's Tennessee, even though they they spent on uh, Calvin Ridley, um, Chicago potentially at nine as the third wide receiver to go with Keenan Allen, who they just drafted. Uh, the general expectation is Adunze is going to go within at least probably the first 12 picks. If he gets past that point, it would be something of a surprise because he's a very complete athletic profile and that Washington offense is kind of a nice teaser for when we get to Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk as the complementary players within the passing offense. A lot of verticals, a lot of four verts, a lot of deep crossers, a lot of deep posts, uh, love to attack the deeper portions of the field and Penix, the one area where Penix is, was on point all season long was throwing dimes down the field. And uh, Odunze has got really good ball tracking skills, but they also had some scheme throws where they would scheme perimeter throws to Odunze and let him get the, the ball in his hands quickly. And he had some size and some fluidity to him. It's the blend of everything that makes him a complete player, which offers something for just about every offensive scheme in the league, regardless of whether or not you're going to run uh, an, an Earhart Perkins vertical passing attack. Uh, where, where you're looking to really shoot the ball down the field, or if you're going to run a timing-based offense. He's got the size to play through press at the, at the line of scrimmage. He's got the fluidity and the body control to reduce his surface, so he's not giving up big chunks of himself for you to really jam him at the line of scrimmage. Uh, he could break off his routes very well. He's got very good ball skills, strong hands, very complete player. Not going to be a play for the Dolphins, if we're being completely honest. So now that we ch check that box, we'll move on. Let's talk Texas. And A.D. Mitchell. I think the thing that that stood out to me the most about Steve Sarkeesian's offense was a lot of parallels. We, we mentioned it with Jatavian Sanders, but in general, I thought there was a lot of parallels to how Texas ran offense to certain elements of how Miami played offense. So it makes sense that Mike McDaniel's there and Chris Greer is, uh, was Chris Greer there? Frank Smith was there. Um, they had a whole slew at the Texas. They they had the full conglomerate was there at the Texas Pro Day, which makes all the sense in the world because you got a speed guy like Xavier Worthy. You got A.D. Mitchell, who's a little bit of a different body type than what you have. And you have Jatavian Sanders, and there's this overlap with a lot of the ideological things that Miami likes to do. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, six foot two and a quarter, 205 pounds. Uh, ran a 434 40 yard dash, which is flying. Had a 39 and a half inch vertical, which is 89th percentile for wide receivers since 2001, the NFL Combine. And a, oh Lordy, I'm going to do the math, 11 foot 4 inch standing broad jump, 136 inches. That's 98th percentile for wide receivers since 2001, the NFL Combine. So explosiveness, linear explosiveness through the nines at six foot two, 205 pounds. Uh, there's some players courtesy of mock draftable that stand out as far as athletic comparables that I think are good names to know. I think the most successful player is DJ Chark and DJ Chark at his peak uh, was a player who won vertically down the field in the NFL. And I think that's where uh, Mitchell's bread and butter will be. I do think there are flashes 
of really dynamic change of direction skills. One of the questions for Mitchell is the consistency of performance. Uh, the motor felt like it ran a little hot and cold. Uh, there were moments where the switch was flipped, and, and if he's early in the progression, you could see the intensity of the routes was a lot more notable, a lot more significant. Is that the kind of player that you want to invest a top 25 draft selection in if you're the Dolphins? I don't have the answer. I know he could track the ball well down the field. He was not particularly consistent in contested catch situations, though. That was the interesting thing about him. I, I know some people want to compare him as, as a more explosive and better route running version of George Pickens, who ended up going in the third round. Pickens has had some big time flashes really splashed at the end of the year last year for Pittsburgh. Once Mason Rudolph came in and they just said, look, we're going to throw you the ball down the field, go win. Pickens is a much better contested ball player than A.D. Mitchell is though. Now, Mitchell, I think can be a better route runner. I think he's more fluid and I think he's got, um, he certainly has better speed and, and linear explosiveness. So you're at this kind of weird intersection where you see the flashes with Mitchell. They didn't really use him a lot. Over the middle, it was a lot of vertical stuff down the field. Uh, there was some some return routes. There was hooks, stuff on the perimeter outside the numbers. He didn't really move around to the same degree as the Xavier Worthy. So from Mitchell's perspective, uh, I, I think this is a player that frees you up to utilize either Jalen Waddell or Tyreek Hill more freely with more consistency while maintaining a vertical element but maybe doesn't bring the same versatility uh, and, and the intensity as a blocker wasn't necessarily where you hoped it would be for a big body player with consistency. The other thing that stood out about A.D. Mitchell that I, I think made him a, a questionable fit for Miami was the run after catch element of his game was not particularly uh, impressive. I thought there were too many instances where uh, he would catch the ball, he would get his eyes upfield, he would take what was immediately available and selectively like avoid contact or go down or get out of bounds. And this is when you're getting outworked for yards after the catch by Xavier Worthy, who weighs 50 pounds, 40 pounds less than you. That's hard to ignore on tape. And that's not to say A.D. Mitchell can't be a good player. I just think his pathway to success as an NFL player, there's a specific role for how that's going to come. And the question is, do I think that's a significant overlap with the Miami Dolphins and how they want to play offense uh, is not something that I think is an open and shut case. We'll talk Xavier Worthy, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Make sure you stick with us. Make sure you get your tickets without the stress, courtesy of Game Time. Game Time is obsessed with finding you ways to save money on your tickets. They have deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, and even an hour after it starts, it is the place to find last-minute seats for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. They also have zone deals where you pick the section, and Game Time picks the seats for big-time savings. They're the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You could buy tickets in seconds with a few taps on your phone, and they give you all in prices to show you your total up front. So there's no surprise fees when you go to check out. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On, L O C K E D O N, for $20 off. Download Game Time today for last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Xavier Worthy from Texas, the reigning 40-yard dash NFL Combine champion. I think what stood out to me about Xavier Worthy was the role and usage at Texas had some mirrored elements to how Mike McDaniel has used Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill. And that's where if the Dolphins' priority and prerogative is to add something different to the wide receiver room, Maybe you can make the argument that A.D. Mitchell would be a better selection or Brian Thomas from LSU, who we're not talking about in this deep dive, would be an option that is attractive to them. But if they're looking to have more layers of what they've been, Worthy, I think, is a dot, 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 sorry in advance, Worthy option for the Dolphins. Is he a Worthy option in 21? 
Uh, I don't think so. I, I think the scenarios in which you would be acquiring Xavier Worthy would probably be predicated on having an abundance of options at 21, trading down out of that pick if you had the opportunity to do so, letting the board come to you as you move down, and then potentially him being the best player available if you move into the late first round or if you move into the early second round altogether to really stop, stock up on top 100 picks. If that's the pathway, that's where I see Worthy being a good value selection for the Dolphins. Uh, you can make the argument, well, if he's your guy, just take him at 21. I get that. That's a really slippery slope. I'd love to maximize the value of every single selection, especially when you have limited assets this year. They put him in the backfield. They put him in motion. They run perimeter screens with him. They put him in the backfield and he runs flats. Remember that touchdown that Tyreek Hill caught against the Jets, the first touchdown? Um, and he got matched up on a linebacker or safety, and it was just way too easy. They ran some some kind of rub on the perimeter, and this this player from depth in the low red zone has to run with Tyreek Hill. They did the, the, the Texas Longhorns did that with Xavier Worthy on a third and six, and Worthy caught the ball out of the backfield. There was a rub. Guy had to come from depth, play over top, attempted to tackle him at the at the sticks, two yards short of the line to gain. Worthy lowers his shoulder. This was against Alabama takes the hit on, spins back inbounds, goes up, gets the first down. At 165 pounds. Reps like that are, are hard to miss. They're fun. They take him outside. They motion him in. They'll hit him with a perimeter screen. They'll get offensive linemen that release out in front of him. Jatavian Sanders is usually involved in a lot of those as well. They've run jet motion with him, end the rounds with him, like they do with Jalen Waddle. They did it with Jalen Waddle probably five times last year. Uh, never really popped a big one. Texas was really close to popping a big one. It was uh, Sanders was out in front versus a corner, and Worthy was on the end around, and he could go inside or outside. And he put his foot in the ground to go inside, but the, the Sanders hadn't attached on the corner yet, so the corner makes the tackle for like six yard gain. Could have been like a six yard touchdown. There's like a lot of overlap, and that's where I consider how Miami has approached this offseason thus far, and they seem to want to continue to invest and what they've been invested in and get better at it and have more options with it and have more depth with it. And uh, that feels like Xavier Worthy. I think of all the players that we're going to talk about here, Xavier Worthy is the best fit with what the Dolphins' offense is. I just don't think it's an appropriate value at 21. And the reason why, I think size and stature is a notable concern. I also don't think Xavier Worthy is as fluid as either or is, is as fluid as Jalen Waddle. I don't think he's short area as sudden as Tyreek Hill. I think he's a little bit more of a strider. You know, he is almost, he's over 5'11 and 165 pounds. So this is not like 5'9, 165, where you're like condensed. He, he's a little bit longer. And as a result of being a little bit more of a strider, I don't think he has the same short area shake. I think he's a little bit more of a, a linear plane player. I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, he didn't do his shuttles uh, because I don't think his shuttles would have been where his his speed testing was or his explosiveness testing for his jumps. He was 99th percentile in 40-yard dash. He was 93rd percentile in 10-yard split. He was 95th percentile in vertical jump, 41 inches. He was 92nd percentile in broad jump, which was 10 feet, 11 inches. So like really, really good numbers. But he was 9th percentile in hand size. His hand size was 8 and 3 quarters inches. He was first percentile in weight for wide receivers, 65, 165 pounds. Uh, his wingspan was 74 and a quarter inches. That's 26th percentile for all wide receivers since 2001. And that shows up when there's throws away from his frame. He doesn't have a great catch radius, and he doesn't have a great level of consistency catching the ball away from his frame. And, you know, there were some instances where he's running slants and Quinn Ewers is throwing hospital YOLO balls high three yards high above his head and he's got to go up and catch it but he knows somebody's going to sit there and stick in his ribs when he comes back down with the ball and he doesn't finish those plays he's got to go down low to dig out throws when Ewers is trying to throw on the move and he can't quite complete those opportunities as well so uh, I, I know some of the criticisms for Jalen Waddle is man he, some of the drops and he's trying to catch the ball against his chest or Tyree Kill these high degree of difficulty away from frame at full speed catches that you're trying to make as a $30 million per year wide receiver. And I hear those. And if you got problems with them with Jalen Waddle and Tyree kill, I promise you, you're going to have the same issues with a first round picking Xavier worthy because they're going to show up on the film. 
So that's some of the concern with Xavier Worthy. Uh, but I, I, I also think the Robbie chosen theory is probably more successful with a player like Xavier Worthy. I think Xavier Worthy is really good in the vertical plane. I do think he can move around. I do think you can scheme some touches for him. He's going to break angles like nobody's business, be a big time run after catch guy. If you get him in space and with the other speed options that Miami has, that should not be difficult to find opportunities to get him in space. But the theory of him being an outside player in the same way that A.D. Mitchell is and having vertical lift and freeing up Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell, but also having some more versatility than I think A.D. Mitchell brings you um, is notable. And when you want to go 11 personnel, the question is, do the Dolphins want to be more valuable when they go with 12 personnel with two tight ends? Whoever they're going to compliment Johnny Smith, whether it's Durham Smythe or an other passing situation, somebody else, or do you want to be more successful in your 11 personnel? And, and what's the recipe look like to get you there? Jalen McMillan and Jalen Pohl. Jalen McMillan, six foot one, 200 pounds, uh, ran a 447, really good uh, broad jump, uh, good tester across the board, big hands, uh, wins down the field. I think the number one athletic comparable for him is a really good description for who this player is. That's Jalen Tolbert, who was drafted by the Cowboys in 2022. Uh, Romeo Dubs or Dobbs, you know, it's the, the, how it's been pronounced has changed three times. So apologies if it's not Dobbs. I think it's pronounced Dobbs now. Uh, with the Green Bay Packers is another name from that 2022 draft class. Those are two very high level athletic profile comparisons for Jalen McMillan. And they were both, you know, mid-round draft picks. I think that's appropriate for McMillan. Would not be surprised if he goes in round three uh, because he can run well. You know, he ran, ran a sub 4-5, 40-yard dash. And he's really smooth. That's the thing about him is he's silky smooth. He's not overly uh, imposing as a player. Uh, he's not particularly high, tall. He's not particularly heavy. He's not particularly long. He's not particularly fast. But... Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that his, his best testing, you know, sub seven second three cone drill and a really good short shuttle as well. So uh, the smoothness for him from Washington stands out and he's got probably just as good of hands as Roma Dunze does. That was the thing that stood out to me with him. Uh, whereas Jalen Polk, the quote unquote other wide receiver, six foot, 200 pounds, four, five, two, a uh, little bit more of a, dynamic route runner than Millen McMillan is, um, but I think has some more questions. It was especially disappointing to find out that he was six, one and a half, 200 pounds and had some of the blocking reps that he did. I think McMillan's a little bit more of a dirty work type player versus Polk's a little bit more of a, just a pass catcher. Uh, so if you're looking for a divide between those two Washington players, I would like McMillan more than Polk just because I, I think if Miami's looking for, I wouldn't say River Craycraft or Braxton Bears because the body types are very different. But if you're looking for a Trent Sherfield with more upside type player, I guess, uh, McMillan would probably be the name that I would lean into because he does a lot of that um, blocking. He does a lot more uh, movement within the offense when Washington would go to move players around. He was a little bit more involved in that aspect of it than Polk was, where Polk, they, they you know try to get in a spot where there was a condensed split when they would go condensed formations or whether it's out on the perimeter and they'd run a lot of scheme throws to the perimeters. Uh, they'd go vertical shots down the field, and then if they had free access, they'd go an outside release and an out route, or they'd do a bubble or with two guys that are stalk blocking on the perimeter. And Polk in almost all those instances when he wasn't getting the ball, and I thought he ran really dynamic routes down the field, but when he wasn't getting the ball, I thought he struggled to, to be an asset within the offense where I think McMillan uh, was the other way around. I think maybe he didn't have as much created separation, but I thought he was somebody who was a more reliable all-around player. So if I had to rank them in order for Miami, I would rank them Roma Dunze, ranked at a stratosphere that won't be in conversation for Miami. I would put Xavier Worthy as the next best option for Miami. Uh, then I would have A.D. Mitchell. Uh, I would have then Jalen McMillan and then Jalen Polk would be how I would order those players as far as 
expectations for where you would draft that player for Miami. I would say uh, Odunze would be a trade up scenario, not really in play for the Dolphins, but it's worth acknowledging him for as good as he is. And, and since we're talking about his program here today on the show, uh, Xavier Worthy is probably a trade down option, ideally. Uh, same would have to go for A.D. Mitchell. I don't think either one of those players, uh, I, I think Mitchell predictively goes in the first round, uh, whereas Worthy's, I think, probably more of a top 40 type player. Uh, the challenge is going to be, you know, realistically anticipating the board and how it's going to break. And is that the direction that you really want to go? Um, cause there, there's probably going to be other players at other spots that are going to be better players and more impactful opportunity players for Miami than what Xavier Worthy would bring. So, uh, for me, both of those Texas wide receivers would be trade down candidates, ideally. And then Jalen McMillan, I would probably target on, on day two, but not at 55. That would have to be fan, kind of manufacturing a later pick somehow along the way. And then Jalen Polk for me would probably be a day three option. That's going to do it for us here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Five NFL prospect wide receivers in the books from the University of Texas, the University of Washington. Hope you guys enjoyed our first of many over the next month, deep dives into some of these players. Some players will get individual deep dives. But this was just too good of a group of too many players that I watched in close succession. We had to hit them all in one shot. Keep it locked in right here on Locked on Dolphins of Kyle Krabs. You can find me on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Make it a great rest of your day. I'm out of here. Fins up.